So we are concluding this series. We started several weeks ago um, on the Lord's Prayer. We have committed as a church family to start off this new year uh, in prayer and and studying uh, how Jesus taught us to effectively pray. And so again, if if you haven't um, seen all of these messages, I encourage you to go back and, and, and listen to them or to watch them. They're available on our YouTube channel as well as uh, podcasted, so if you want to just listen to the sermons, those are available as well. Um, but I, I encourage you to go back and to look at, at everything that, that Jesus taught us about effective prayer that we've, that we've seen in this series. Yeah, this, uh, this is a very famous prayer, the Lord's Prayer. It's found a few different places in Scripture. The most famous one uh, is right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus uh, teaches about effective prayer. And then he gives us this model prayer in the Lord's Prayer. And this is found in Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 13. So if you have your Bible with you, I invite you to open with me uh, to Matthew chapter 6. If you don't have your own Bible, don't have it with you this morning, uh, and you're here with us in person, you can grab uh, one of those Bibles out of the seats, and you're welcome to use that. And if you're with us online, uh, hopefully you have your Bible with you. If not, you can just listen as I read it. But we're going to look at Matthew 6, uh, 5 through 13. Where it says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that is all the reward they will ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. Then your Father who sees everything will reward you. And when you pray, don't babble on and on as people of other religions do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them, for your Father knows exactly what you need even before you ask Him. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. As we see here, Jesus gives some, some introductory thoughts and teachings on what effective prayer looks like before he gives us the model prayer uh, in the Lord's Prayer there in those, those last verses we just read. Again, we could sum up Jesus' teaching about effective prayer uh, with this statement, and again, we've, we've looked at this every week of the series, so you should already know what it is, right? And that is, effective prayer is more about your perspective and posture than about your practice, Again, your perspective, what perspective am I, am I bringing to the Lord when I pray? What is my posture, not just my physical posture, but the posture of my heart? Am I, am I open to God's voice, or am I just telling God what I think he should do? Right? What is the posture of, and again, our, our physical posture of how we pray can be representative or help us with the posture of our heart. Right, if we get on our knees to pray, it's a sign of humbleness, right? And, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm submitting to who God is. Right, or maybe stand and with, and with my hands raised to pray and as I praise God for who he is and, and in thankfulness. Right, but my perspective and my, and my posture is more important than my practice. The biggest part about our practice is if we actually do it, is if we actually pray. And it's been one of my hopes for this series is that no matter what your prayer life looked before we dove into this, I hope that your prayer life is more effective now than it was seven weeks ago when we started this series. But I hope that it will continue to be that. Uh, as, as, we, as we look at, at, again, this framework of prayer that Jesus gives, you may have noticed that, that this, this version of the Lord's Prayer that we just read in the NLT version is different than the traditional version of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, again, depending on your faith background, you might have, have just recited the Lord's Prayer every week as a part of your religious practice. Maybe, maybe you've never heard it before, but if you've heard it recited at a service or at a funeral or whatever it might be, the version that you likely heard or have recited was the King James Version. And just as we've done through this series, if you want to repeat it with me, you're welcome to do that. Um, but we are going to, again, just look at here the traditional version of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So we've been going phrase by phrase through this prayer throughout this series. Uh, week one, we looked at our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy, and we saw the tension that we must manage as a part of our faith journey between our Abba Father, right, our, our deep connection and relational God that we serve, and the all-power sovereign God. And the tension is the fact that God is both of those. And may your kingdom come soon. We looked at the three aspects of faith. That this addresses how God's kingdom needs to be established in our own hearts and the second coming of Christ and in God's kingdom being spread through us as his followers. It comes down to what kingdom are you building with your life? Are you building your own or are you building God's kingdom? In week three, we looked at may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We saw how God's will is already established in heaven and yet we are requesting that his will also be done in our life in the same way. We saw how, again, this phrase, the whole prayer was leading up to this phrase as it encompasses everything we've, we've addressed already. Um, and, and yet it gets us to the point of full submission to God's will. And then we moved on to the first of three asks of God. The first ask is to give us today the food we need. And we learned, again, this is not just about physical food, but more importantly about spiritual food and about filling up our soul. And then last week we looked at forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And we learned how we need to have an ongoing lifestyle of confession and repentance. And that confession reminds us of our need for God and our need for the faith community. And now today, then, we are to this final phrase of the Lord's Prayer, the third ask, and that is uh, when we ask to not yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. And as we look at this phrase, this one, just like all of the others, is very packed, full of lots of, of theology about what we know about God, what we know about us and his creation and how we interact. Right? And there is so much to unpack again into this phrase. And not only are we looking at this phrase today, but we're also wrapping up the entire series. And so uh, with that said, this, this is your warning right as we go, is we have a lot to cover today. And in fact, in looking at that, and, and I, I, I always cut out different stuff throughout this series because I just don't have enough time to cover everything I'd like to cover. And I cut out a lot today, and I think it's still a lot to cover. So, so be ready. Okay, we're going to be looking at lots of verses and, and lots of scripture this morning. But before we dive into that, I just want to say that not only are we concluding, concluding the series today, but this is also one month after I gave you a one-month challenge, right? which means that the month is done, right? The challenge is done. I warned you last week, you had one week to make progress if you haven't done so yet. And now we have reached the end of that challenge. The one-month challenge was for you to move forward in your faith, to take the next step within the month to grow in your faith. As there was so much going on in our world throughout the past month, the challenge was to focus on Jesus for stability, not on the chaos around us. And so now that that one month has passed, what progress have you made? How has your prayer life changed? How has your faith journey moved forward? And just as we've been, been blessed the last several weeks of seeing different journey videos and, and people, uh, again, filling us in on what God's done in their lives, we would love to hear from you about how this series has helped you, about how the One Month Challenge went for you. And so today, literally today, we have a video camera set up in our Mommy and Me room today, and, and after, before you leave, we'd love for you to just swing through there and give us even a 10-second snippet into how your one-month challenge went, how your prayer life has changed. Again, can we celebrate together what God has done? And so I said, that's set up over here, and you can come over right into the kids there. Um, Lee's going to be in there ready to record uh, your testimony. Like I said, it can be just 10 seconds or even a little bit longer, but we'd love to get as many as we could today, right, of, uh, of you doing that. If you don't have time to stop or you want to think about it, 
um, you can always just record it yourself, right? Selfie style on your phone and get us that video. But again, we want to pu- just pull all those together and that we can, uh, again, watch them on those pre- and make up some different pre-service videos that we'll watch as we can all celebrate together what God's done, not just through the series, as well as through the One Month Challenge. So we'd love for you to, to please do that today. So as we dive into this last phrase, just like last week, this is a two-part phrase. Right? Don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. So we're going to start, though, today with the second part of the phrase, and that is the, the rescue us from the evil one request. So f- before we start off into that, the kind of first biggest question is, well, why is there an evil one? Why is there even evil? Wouldn't it be a lot easier if God just didn't allow that? And you're right, it would be easier. Right? However, we realize that the fact that God exists means that evil naturally exists. Because evil is the opposite of who God is. God is perfect. God is holy. He is good. He is loving. And, and if you remove God, what, is, what you're left with is evil. It is the, the natural other side of the coin of who God is. And, and in fact, evil is not its own substance. It's what's left when you remove God from anything. Hey, we are going through, we have a small group on Wednesday nights that we're going through this book called The Garden. And again, that book addresses this question about, well, why do we even have evil? And there's this quote in, the, in that book on page 30 that says, evil is the absence of God. This means that in the space between man and God, evil exists. And this space is necessary because God had to give us a choice. Now again, even just diving into that statement just brings up a whole lot more questions. And, and again, as we look at that though, um, to say why do we have evil, evil is there because without, if we didn't have evil, we also wouldn't have God. And we also would not have a choice, which means we wouldn't have free will. Which means we would not have the ability to be an authentic, loving relationship without a choice. And as we realize that, again, when we think about, again, we, there is a choice so that love can happen. Because love is only love if it's freely given. You know, which today's Valentine's Day, you might have noticed that. Man, if you're just fighting that out, it's too late. I'm sorry. Hey, you know, so it's, I, I dressed for my Valentine today. Right? She, she picked out my clothes, so you can thank her. But as we look at that, again, why do we have evil? The, we realize we have to have evil, but then the next question comes up is, is who is the evil one? I mean, as Jesus prays here, he says, rescue us from the evil one. So again, my natural question, well, who's that? Right, well, the evil one, again, is described throughout Scripture. Um, the Scripture addresses the evil one by a few different names. Lucifer, the devil, you've probably heard these names before. And, and the reality is that the evil one is a fallen angel, which means he was created as an angel, and yet he rebelled against God and, and was kicked out of heaven, and that, that battle and, and effect and result of that is described within Scripture, it's described in Revelation. And so we realize that he is a fallen angel, which also tells us right, that the evil one is not divine. And it's very easy to, to, to give him the same attributes as we give to God. And, and yet he values that because that in itself is a lie. Right? And, and gives the evil one more power than what he really has in our minds and in our hearts in the way that we even fear him. Again, he is not divine, which means he does not have divine attributes. He is not all-knowing. He is not omnipresent. He is not all-powerful. Right? God is. And he is not God. He is a fallen angel. We see Jesus describes the evil one in John 8, 44. He's, he's involved in this, uh, this back and forth debate with some of the religious leaders and about their father because he's claimed that God is his father who is claiming he's the Messiah. And they're going back and forth. And Jesus comes straight out to them and, and calls them, right, children of the devil. And uh, again, I wish Jesus would have really told us what he really wanted to know, you know, if if he didn't pull back at all. 
John 8, 44, he says, For you are the children of your father, the devil, and you love to do the, the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. Because there is no, and when he lies, it's consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of all lies. Again, these are the words of Jesus, and they like said that it gives us, tells us a lot about who the evil one is. Right? We also learn in Revelation 21 that his fate is already sealed, right? that the eternal lake of fire was created for him and, and the angels that defected with him that we know as demons, right? and that he is already lost. And yet he is still um, has this, this strategy right, of getting as many of us to go with him into that fire as he can. Because he knows he cannot hurt God. God is more powerful than him. Right? But he can try to hurt God by hurting what God loves. And that is us. Right? And so we know his fate is sealed. We know that he's already left. And we also see through what Jesus describes here of the enemy's main strategy. Right? And his main strategy is deception. To lie to us to get us to believe things as truth that aren't truth at all. And again, Jesus in John 10 gives us, again, the ultimate goal of the enemy as, and how it is in direct contrast to what God wants for you. Again, words of Jesus in John 10, 10, says that the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. And I think when we look around our world today, we realize how successful the enemy is at stealing and killing and destroying things that God loves. Right? And as we realize this, we see again that, that there is an evil one, and it's one that, again, even through this prayer, we need to acknowledge this, the presence, right, and, and that it's real. Okay, but then the next question, right, the next natural question I have is, so if I'm asking to be rescued from the evil one, well, what do I need rescued from? Right? Why do I need to not just acknowledge the existence of the evil one, but, but why do I need rescuing? Again, as we, as we ask this question, there, there is, uh, again, Scripture speaks to it. In fact, the, the, the best place it does is when it talks about this, this cosmic battle that is going on between good and evil. It's Again, we are given very specific instructions about this battle in Ephesians chapter 6. In, in Ephesians 6, uh, verses uh, 10 through 12, it says a final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Again, Paul tells us in this passage, and it's described in several other places in Scripture, about the fact that we are in a war. Right? And we do not have a choice whether we're going to be in it or not. We are in it. But the choice we have is, are we going to stand firm and fight back, or are we going to be taken out by the enemy? Right? And when we realize that we are a part of this war, we also realize that the core of this advice right, is that we don't rely on our, our power to win. We rely on the power of God, right? on the divine power, right? on, on his presence. We are strong in the Lord. We rely on his mighty power, right? and through that we can stand firm. And we uh, just... Several, it was about a year ago, probably, I think, was we did an entire message series on this passage on the armor of God. Again, if you weren't here for that, I encourage you to go back and watch those sermons uh, that we dove very deep into the armor, why we need it, what the battle looks like, and all that. But as we know, we need to be rescued again from the evil one in the midst of this battle, but yet we don't fight with our power, but with God's power, because remember, God wins. He always wins. Because he is all-powerful, right? He is the Alpha, the Omega. Hallowed be his name. And yet, and we also realize that, that the enemy uses lots of different strategies against us. Okay, Paul also writes here in 2 Corinthians 2, 
uh, 9 through 11. And he was describing in this passage about some, some fighting that happened in the church. And, and I, I know what you're thinking. That would never happen in any church. But it, did, it does, doesn't it? Right? And, and it was happening in this church. And, and Paul addresses them in this passage about forgiving this, this man who was causing division. Here in, in this passage, in, in 2 Corinthians 2, verses 9 through 11, he says, And I wrote to you as I did to test you and to see if you would fully comply with my instruction. For when you forgive this man, I forgive him too. And when I forgive whatever needs to be forgiven, I do so with Christ's authority for your benefit, so that Satan will not outsmart us, for we are familiar with his evil schemes. I encourage you on your outline or your Bible to, to underline or circle that phrase of Satan will not outsmart us. Again, Paul is addressing issue now. Every church has problems. Every church has, has drama, unfortunately. Right? And that's because we're humans. We're fallen humans, right? And, and yet one of the strategies we learn here, one of the main strategies of the enemy is to cause division in our churches. Right, and just as Paul says, let's not be unaware of these strategies. Right, and let's fight back in the right ways. Right, and, and that is through, again, through the power of Christ and, and through the power of the gospel and the love and the forgiveness that comes with that. And when you think about, again, what's the answer to all of that? Well, we go back to last week, right, about confession and repentance and our need for community. Right? And all of that, we, we understand though, the, but the, the reason I bring it up here today is because to say is that the enemy has his strategies, but we will not be outsmarted, right? Because we are fighting with the right power of God and, and God is truth and he, he reveals the hearts of people. Again, we, this is all things that have been addressed earlier in the prayer. And as we realize this, then uh, we, we realize that, again, we need to be rescued, right, from this evil one. We are involved in this battle. We don't have that, we don't have that choice, but, but yet we do have a choice if we're going to fight back. And as we are praying this, in this model prayer, we're acknowledging, right, that we are fighting back. We will not be taken out. And then we lo- look back to the very first part of this phrase, which is the don't let us yield to temptation part. Right? And this is truly where that battle starts for, for every one of us, is dealing with temptation. As we think about that, there's some things we need to, to learn again through Scripture about temptation. Okay? And the, the first point I want to bring up about temptation is the fact that God is not the source of temptation. God is not the source of temptation. Again, this is one of the lies that the enemy tells us, right? That, oh, God is tempting you. God's just waiting for you to mess up. He's, he's testing you. Okay, God is not the source of temptation. In fact, James chapter 1, verses 12 through 15 tells us, says that God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. And remember, when you are being tempted, do not say, God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. God is not the source of temptation. It is our sinful nature that is the source of temptation. It is the evil in our world that is the source of temptation. Right? God is not the source. And I mean, literally, James tells us exactly, he says, do not say that God is tempting you. Right? And therefore, exposes one of the lies of the enemy. Again, we're learning about his strategies, aren't we? Right? That God is not tempting us. And yet, we, we also learn from this scripture and others, right, that, that everyone is tempted. Right? Everyone is tempted because we are in a fallen world. Because evil exists, because we are born with a sinful nature, right? Which, again, goes back to the foundation of the gospel, that we all need a Savior. And because that is true, we will all be tempted because we live in a fallen world. And yet, we get this advice out of 1 Peter 
5, verses 8 and 9. They tell us to stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. Again, that's one of the other strategies of the devil, right, that Peter addresses here is this lie about you're the only one that's tempted to do that. Right? And sin thrives in secrecy. And, and when, when we see that, that's another, again, strategy of the devil. He's prowling around looking for somebody to devour. Don't get devoured. Because we are not unaware of his schemes. Right? The easiest battle to win is one that nobody knows they're in. Right? But we know we're in it, don't we? Right? Which means we can stand firm. We can fight back. We will not be devoured. We will not be taken out by the enemy if we fight back the way that God tells us to fight back. But again, we know that everyone is tempted. And just he says, don't be surprised when you're tempted. Right? It's going to come. In fact, Everybody gets tempted all around the world. Every believer is, experiences the same thing. Don't be surprised when temptation comes. But also know that temptation does not equal sin. Temptation does not equal sin. Again, another lie of the enemy, right? That we feel guilty for being tempted. And yet, if everybody's tempted, and yet temptation also does not equal sin. They being, now again, just as these passages have already told us, when you're tempted, right, there, there's a way out. Right? There's, there, you can fight back. You can stand firm. You don't have to give in to that temptation. And because when you do give in to that temptation is when it turns into sin. And just as we see from these previous passages, once you give in to that sin is where that sin grows and where it becomes damaging and where it gets between you and God. In fact, we know that temptation does not equal sin because Jesus himself was tempted. It's, it's, um, it's in scripture, several different places, talking about the different temptations that Jesus faced. In fact, we, a very famous one right, is found in Luke chapter 4 and also Matthew chapter 4, when right after Jesus was baptized, right before he goes into public ministry um, as the Messiah, is that he went into the desert and was tempted by the devil himself. And again, there's lots to be learned about that, that description of what Jesus went through in the middle of that desert and how he did not sin. And yet we know that he did not sin, even though he was tempted. In Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 and 15, tell us that. And they said, so then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do Yet he did not sin. But again, at the core of the gospel, the core of our faith is the fact that the Messiah didn't sin. Which is why he can be the perfect sacrifice, right? And die in our place. If he did sin, he'd have to pay for his own sin. Right? But he didn't. So he can be the perfect sacrifice and take our place because of that. And yet we know, again, through Scripture, that Jesus was tempted. So temptation does not equal sin. It's another lie of the enemy. You don't have to feel guilty for being tempted. But you would feel guilty if you give in to that temptation. And it turns into sin in your life. Which leads us then, as we've looked at, exposed all these different strategies and lies of the enemy about temptation. Here's a truth about temptation, okay, is that temptation is an opportunity to grow. Okay, temptation is an opportunity to grow because temptation is when you're faced with a choice, right? Am I going to give in to the evil or the sin in my life, or am I going to not give in and therefore turn my face to Christ? And when I do that, I'm going to grow. I'm going to move forward in my faith when I do that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 12 through 13, tells us, he says, If you think you're standing strong, then be careful not to fall. 
The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. And when you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. When we see, again, this this idea, right, of of being tempted, we will all be tempted. We we know that temptation's around the corner if it's not already right in your face right now. But yet that temptation is an opportunity for you to grow in your faith, to stand firm, to, to turn to God instead of towards sin. There is a choice to be made every time you are tempted. And you will either turn towards holiness and being more like Christ in resisting that temptation, or you will instead turn towards that sin. Obviously, this is connected very closely to the confession and repentance we talked about last week. But even I mentioned it last week where one of the problems if we have confession without repentance is that we end up confessing the same thing over and over and over again. And that's the reality of, of, of that, is if that's what's happening in your life, then, then it's, it's not a confession problem, it's a repentance problem. Okay, and repentance is going in a new direction. Right? Is, is protecting myself from myself so I don't end up at that same place. And when, when we realize that, right, then, then again, I need to, to take new ground, not at that moment, I'm choosing sin, but, but I need to step back a little bit and set up some boundaries in my life that I don't end up in that moment, right? So that I, I don't end up, you know, um, in, where I'm right on the edge and just with, with one wrong choice in that moment, I end up falling off the edge into sin again. And this applies in many different ways and in and, 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 and many different sins and whatever it is in your life, right, maybe that you've confessed over and over again. Okay, the reality is the way out that God provides for you is not always in that moment. It's several steps before you get there. And that's part of the way out is, is making those changes in your life so they don't end up in that most tempting place. And that's what real repentance is. Right, is changing those things in my life to make sure I don't get back in that same place. Let me tell you what I mean, a couple practical examples. I tell you, if, if, if I struggle with alcohol okay, and drinking too much, if that's a sin for me, the, 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 the real battle is not won, right, late at night when I'm frustrated and tired and I'm looking at the bottle. Now, again, that's the moment of temptation, right, when I'm going to choose to drink or, or to walk away, but... but the way out starts long before that, right? Part of repentance, when I confess that dependence on alcohol, part of that moving in a new direction is getting rid of the alcohol from my house, right? Part, part of that is not going to the bar. Instead, I'll go somewhere else. Right? If I know I'm always gonna be tempted by myself, I, then I just go to bed earlier, right? Or go to a friend's house and not be isolated by myself. Okay, and those are just as valid ways out of that temptation than ever sitting there staring at the bottle. If I struggle with lust and looking at pornography, right, that battle starts long before I'm sitting in front of the computer. Do I click it or do I not? Right, it's setting up those boundaries in my life where I put a filter on my phone. Right, when I tell my spouse or, or a, a trusted person about the struggle, Again, that I, I realize those times when I'm most tempted and avoid those. Right? When I get, again, those, I, I bring other people into, and it's exactly what it says, right, through repentance, is I bring community into that struggle. Right? And again, the way out happens long before that most tempting moment of like when you're sitting there going, do I click it or do I not? Okay, if I struggle with profanity in my life, right, the it starts with thinking about, again, setting up those boundaries about what am I listening to in my life? Do I continue to hear those profanities all the time in the music that I listen to, in the movies that I watch, in the people that I hang around? And if I don't want to let my mouth sound that way, I need to change what I'm taking into my heart and my mind. 
Do I need to keep going? Do we get the idea? Right? The way out is long before, most times is long before that habitual sin when I'm sitting there in that moment. Right? And that's the core of what repentance really is. Right? When I think about temptation, I think about, again, the way out that God gives me. The way out is God showing me how damaging it really is in my life and that I get to set up these new boundaries in my life to protect myself from myself. So I'm not relying on my power, but I'm relying on God's power. Right? And that's a move forward. That's a move towards Christ. There is a choice to be made every time you are tempted, and it is an opportunity to grow. We see in James chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, it says, So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come close to God, and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and God. In the world. Again, James again pulls back the veil on, on, on this, this other, these lies, right? And strategy of the devil to, the, you know, the real problem isn't a habitual sin. Maybe the real problem is where my loyalties are at. What is my heart focused on? Because there is a promise given here. Right, and that promise is, if you resist, evil will flee. And the more you resist, the more you come close to God. And the closer you come to God, the more of God you will have. That kind of stands to reason, doesn't it? But that's also an incredibly powerful promise. If you seek God and make him the king of your heart, that then he will come close to you. And the closer he is to you, the further you'll be from evil. Now, but also, there's, there's a warning that comes with this promise, right? Because it tells us to resist the devil and he will flee. And that is true. However, there is no timeline attached to that promise. And think about, and that's one of the lies, right, that we get. We think, oh, I just resist temptation one time and then I'm done. Right, that's a lie. Right? Because when, the, when you engage in a fight, what's, what's the enemy going to do the first time you punch back? Well, they're going to step up their game. Right? Like, oh, they, they said that, whatever. Well, I'll, I'll give them this way around that boundary, right? Or, or whatever. The, the enemy doesn't give up that easy. And again, I, I've seen it in my life, and I've worked with many others in their lives. If they start resisting the devil, right, is that they get messed with harder at first. And the more you stand firm, the more the devil realizes that you're not going to give loyalty back to him at all, and then he will flee. Right? This promise will happen, but I'm telling you, it's not going to happen the first time you resist. Because that's another strategy of the devil that we know about. Right? Which means you start resisting and you put on that armor stronger every day. Right? And you stand firm no matter what the enemy throws at you. Right? And you continue to resist until he flees. And again, I don't know where you're at today. You might have been started resisting and maybe you're wondering like, man, I resisted, but yet things just got worse. And yeah, if things got worse when you resisted, that means you are going down the right path towards this promise. So stand firm. Keep resisting. Keep fighting. Right? And they will flee. Now, as we see this last phrase and, and all that it encompasses, we look back over the entire prayer and we see, again, all that God taught us is through Jesus and this model prayer. Now we get to the ending, and there's this, this doxology ending of the prayer, okay? And it's in the King James Version, and it's not in the NLT Version, and our, and our newer translations of Scripture, not just NLT, but it's not there. It's, it's as you noticed, right, there's, it's tagged onto the end. Okay, in the earliest Greek manuscripts, 
um, of Scripture, this ending is not on the model prayer. And that's why NLT doesn't include it. Okay, it's still there. It's down in the footnote of, of the text. Okay, but what, that's why most modern translations don't include it, is because the earliest Greek manuscripts did not have it. These manuscripts were not yet discovered when the King James and other older translations were made. And so therefore, that's why they do include it, because it is in the later manuscripts, which means, right, that a scribe somewhere along the line added it. Okay, now, um, we, most scholars believe that this, this traditional doxology is based on 1 Chronicles 29, verses 11 through 13. This is a prayer of David when he uses very similar language. Okay, and, and, but yet, again, it's been added on, right, which is why it's, it's not in the text, right, because now we have older manuscripts, more reliable ones, to look back and compare it. But yet, it's still an important ending, and I think to acknowledge that it's there because of the attitude it brings. And when we talk about the posture of our prayer, okay, is that this, this ending, this for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever, amen. This, this posture of a heart that comes out of this saying, again, I believe is reflected by Jesus in the way he prayed. And in fact, at, at the very end of his life, right before he goes to the cross, he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. Okay, and in Luke 22, we get, we get one of the different glimpses into that prayer. Okay, and, and it says that, that he, being Jesus, walked away about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, Father, if you're willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. And again, that this, this even doxology tag on the end of the Lord's Prayer acknowledges this attitude. God, I've given you these things. This is what I want. But ultimately, you're the king. You decide. Your will be done, not mine. And the reality is that even in this, Jesus is, is showing, right, that very last temptation that he faced. Right? And that temptation was, I don't have to go to the cross. Because he knew what was coming. He knew the suffering. He knew, you know, the death, the, the price that had to be paid. And again, this is the human part of Jesus that's saying, God, I don't want to do that. And yet he submits, opens his heart, right, and submits himself to God's will and says, yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Right, in fact, when we see this attitude, this is exactly what we are saying when we say the word amen. In fact, the literal translation of the word amen okay, in, in Greek is so be it. Right, when we get to the end of our prayer, and we've laid our hearts out, and we've, we've done everything that Jesus taught us to do in this model prayer. Right, and we get to the end, and, and the last thing we say to God is, so be it, Lord. Your will, not mine. I've told you everything that I think. Now your will be done. I submit to what you want to do, God whether you, you take into account what I said or whether you don't, right? it's okay with me because you're God. I, and I submit myself to that. When you look at all of this, all of this that's encompassed in this very famous prayer, right? I, I hope that your heart has been drawn closer to Christ because of this study. I hope that your journeys move forward. I hope that the next time you face temptation that you'll go back to that true repentance Say, nope, not going there again. Right, which brings me to my final thought this morning, and that is the same final thought that I gave on week one. Okay, and it comes out of Ephesians 3, 14 through 16. It says, when I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and earth. And I pray that from this glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Again, I don't know where you're at in your faith journey, but I hope you've moved forward because of your life of prayer, because of what you've learned through this. Yet if you've never received Christ as your Savior, I hope that you will be able to open up your heart and accept him today and invite him into your life because you will not win this battle without him in your life, without the presence of the Holy Spirit. And you get that by accepting and praying and inviting him into your life for the first time. 
Whether you've accepted Christ as your Savior already or you never have, I hope that today you will take a step forward. Lord God, we know that you are good and we thank you for that. God, we thank you that no matter what we face, God, that you will rescue us from the evil one. God, help us in our lives, God, to not give in to temptation, God, but to submit ourselves to you and to your will. God, we love you. We thank you that you're with us. God, we thank you that as we resist, Lord, temptation and the evil one, God, that we in turn draw closer to you. God, may you continue to lead us, God, in our own prayer life. God, in our own journey with you, that, Lord, as we make these, this progress in our journey, God, that we won't leave what we've learned behind. God, we will continue to grow. And God, that through our growth, we will show this world who you really are and how much they need you. God, we thank you for all you taught us in the Lord's Prayer. Lord, as we go this week, help us to truly live it out. We love you. Guide us as we go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.